Led Zeppelin was on hiatus. Jimmy Page was interviewed and denied rumors about them splitting up. The richest band in the world and nothing was happening. Nobody knew for how long. Without a tour or recording session to occupy their time, there were long days to be filled, waiting for something, anything to happen. Robert considered going back to school and train as a teacher. He applied for a position at Rudolf Steiner Education System in Sussex. I thought there was something far more honest and wholesome about putting the ego away in the closet. Both me and John lived very close to each other. We both came from the black country. We both got black country wives and black country women. And um, so we had to go back and do the big thing, like be dad, go to the football, you know, do everything that you would do if you were a civil engineer or if you were, you know, working in the coal mine. Um, but, of course, I try and figure it out now um, because I was only 20 when it kicked off. Good God. I'm 32 when it stopped. Good God. So, really... I was growing as a man and as a father and dealing with crises that come through life anyway and family and people's adjustment to who you have become. Not just you, other people's perceptions. Absolutely, yeah. And it's kind of interesting, really, because you do end up as an island quite often because of that, because no matter how much of a, as they say in the black country, a mucker that you are, people still want to know, well, I wonder... And, of course, I know the answers. And the answer is yes, yes and yes. Uh, so, so it was a bit of a sort of... Um, it was like skating on thin ice, and I did grow up very ragged through it. On the business side of things, Swan Song was starting to break down. Led Zeppelin's business rule of keeping 90% of the box office made them many enemies, including several mob-connected promoters who were kept away from big loads of cash. Led Zeppelin was a multi-million business generating enormous amount of revenue for an even larger corporation. Very important people were becoming impatient. Despite having their own label, all their distribution was done through Atlantic since 74. Phil Carson A and R from Atlantic at the time. A huge part of Atlantic's money came from them, I'll admit it, nobody wanted to kill the golden goose. According to Grant's biography, Bring It On Home, an external shady character with alleged mafia connections, played a key role in an attempt to remove him as manager, therefore, accessing Led Zeppelin's unhindered accumulation of wealth. Grant's girlfriend at the time, Cindy Russell, remembers meeting the alleged mobster. As soon as I met him I heard the threats against Peter's son. I never knew if he was full of shit, but he knew people. I remember a story about him hanging a guy out of a helicopter in Central America, I'm sure he was scoping out my own family back in Chicago, I was followed. Peter Grant didn't have a father growing up, and had always protected his boys but grew weak. A painful divorce in 77 and the overall tensions made him recluse. Being one of the toughest managers in rock took a toll on his mental and physical health. Peter Grant suffered a heart attack but survived. Grant, Bonham, Binden, and Cole pleaded no low contender for the Jim Matsorkis beating at Oakland. Zeppelin avoided the scrutiny from law enforcement. Binden was given a 60-day suspended jail sentence and a $300 fine, while the others were charged with $200 each. Bill Graham's security staffer, Jim Matsorkis, died from COVID-19 complications on December 20, 2020. Back in the black country, Plant walked around with a shotgun and a bottle of Johnny Walker trying to shoo the press. He didn't want to leave his family. John Bonham's loyalty, friendship and almost daily visits were key in supporting his friend through depression. It was Plant who convinced Bonzo of joining the New Yardbirds in 1968. Ten years gone and 1978 saw Bonham persuading the singer into coming back to Led Zeppelin. Several false starts happened before Robert was ready. Robert kept saying he'd do it, and then back down, Bonzo was a tower of strength, we had a meeting at the Royal Garden Hotel, and they started talking about Swan Song Artists Bat Company and Maggie Bell, and all that and I said, what the fuck are you talking about, you should worry about your own careers. Grant suggested the group should jam at Clearwall Castle, a famous retreat and recording space for rock bands of the era including Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Queen, and Whitesnake. There was no pressure to do anything more than having fun. Plant finally joined them in May for rehearsals.
Sessions were resumed on September 1978 in London. Six weeks of rehearsals got them a new set of songs and studio time booked for November at Polar Studios. October 3rd. In between the Zeppelin agenda, Jones and Bonham played as guest musicians on Paul McCartney's Rochester theme from his Back to the Egg album. The song's supergroup lineup included David Gilmour, Kenny Jones, Gary Brooker, Linda McCartney and Tony Ashton to name a few. A Zeppelin trademark tune with elements from past glories. A tight but loose approach that would have made for a great live track mixed with a 50s covers medley. As an instrumental piece, it's a hard rock swinging treat. Bonham's thunder bass drums locked in with Jones and Jimmy's precise riffing. Robert Plant's phrasing choices make this for an uneven experience. If only he'd taken more time to them, Darlene would sit up there with her other retro style pieces. As much fun you can tell the band was having at the end, it probably goes on for a bit too long, with Plant the main offender running out of lyrics. Some of it sounds like a revamped version of the Ocean's Swing section. This outtake was published on Coda in 1982. January 21, 1979. The Plant family celebrates the arrival of their new family member, Logan Romero Plant. Electric Light Orchestra's Jeff Lynn turned down the offer to headline the Nebworth Festival. Promoter Freddie Bannister tried to get Zeppelin into the festival twice, before settling for the Allman and Doobie Brothers in 74, and the Stones in 76. Peter Grant knew Robert didn't want to tour, but the event could launch Led Zeppelin's live comeback. We were the biggest band in the world, so we better get out there and show them we still are. A verbal agreement was reached for two shows on August 4th and 11th. The band's fee was £1 million, the largest ever paid for a single act at the time. Tickets were put on sale in June. Four weeks later, Bannister tried convincing Grant to cancel the second show due to low ticket sales. Peter shut him off. This is the biggest fucking band in the world and we can do two dates. Led Zeppelin rehearsed at Bray Film Studios near London and traveled to Nepworth in July for a site inspection, publicity photos and perform a sound check. Peter Grant tried to bolster the bill with supporting acts. Die Straits were approached to play and refused, in the words of their manager, Ed Bicknell, I said the band wasn't ready. I didn't like playing without your sound and lights on the bill, where the audience has only come to see Led Zeppelin. Peter was isolated, and he overestimated how many people his band could draw. They also hadn't recognized how much tastes had changed. The band played two warm-up gigs in Copenhagen, Denmark on July 23rd and 24th.
To quote John Paul Jones in 1980, Punk woke us up. The band delivers a breathtaking performance of speed metal punch. A song too heavy for in through the outdoor, but nevertheless a reminder that they could cut down the waffle and rock hard preceding thrash metal by a few years. Although vocals seem to be worn and torn here, it makes sense in the context of the song's attitude. It feels like a middle finger to all new bands. Beware of Led Zeppelin. This would be released on Coda in 1982, and is a good preview of what their next record could have been. Jimmy and Bonzo wanted to return to their hard rock roots. Before he died, we'd already discussed what the next album was going to be like, what the approach was going to be like after because we'd had a very guitar, well, the presence was, was all guitars, there were no keyboards on it whatsoever, which gave, gave the ground to be able to do a keyboard album, because there'd been keyboards on the rest of the albums, not on presence, but on the, the, the album called In Through the Outdoor, that was great, uh, the keyboards were really featured on that, because John Paul Jones had bought this um, amazing synth synthesizer outfit called the Dream Machine, so I think that says it all, really. Um, and uh, and he, he'd actually started to write some full songs, so that was really good. Um, but we discussed, um, John and I had discussed what the, that we were going to go more back into the guitar power. As an extended note, it's worth mentioning one of Jimmy's hard rock riffs from 1978 that didn't get developed into a song until 1993's Shake My Tree. Mr. Page. We did a sound check for Nebworth, <coughs> this remarkably big concert you were at about. And the stage was about 40, 50 feet off the ground, some ridiculous height. And uh, three days before the gig, we went down there and Jason came with us and he played with the band while Bonzo went out front to hear what it was like. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know what we did, but it was great. And it was really funny because, I mean, he really hit the drums. But at the same time, the sound engineers were like whacking the sound up. Mm -hmm. And there was something like a 100,000 watt PA, so something really over the top. Fortunately, we needed it. But anyway, that night we had complaints from seven miles away because of the sand. It was that loud. And he helped to contribute to the complaints. <laughs> it was great. Then he went back to school. Mm. Yeah, he's a great little kid, great drummer. He's, you know, I hope he does well. Do you think he'll be going on to do that professionally? Well, I don't know. I mean, he's, uh, he's at the age now where he's like doing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, How old is he now? 15.
Bayern. John Bonham, James Patrick Page. You'll never walk alone. Oh, 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 oh. We hold in your heart. First show, August 4th. Both the press and many in attendance considered the performances to be a bit rusty. Some parts were great, some musically inept, and sometimes it moved between the two in the space of a few minutes. The band sounded powerful and nervous at the same time. Well, I try and come up with some banal comments. You are? You are? Well, all you people have come so far. It's been like a kind of blind date, if you like. Not many. <laughs> oh, we're even loosening up and laughing. John Paul Jones admitted Robert didn't want to do it. I could understand why, but we thought he'd really enjoy it if we could just get him back out there. In recent years, Robert Plant's take on the event was blunt. Nebworth was useless. It was no good at all, it was no good because we weren't ready to do it, the whole thing was a management decision. It felt like I was cheating myself because I wasn't as relaxed as I could have been. I was racked with nerves. It was our first British gig in four years. Problems began before the second Nebworth date. Promoter Freddie Bannister didn't have the money as they hadn't sold enough tickets for the August 4th date, claiming only 104,000 attended, he hoped Grant would reduce their fee. Zeppelin's management reported 250,000 people were there and expected their payment. Freddie got a visit from a man wearing a suit and dark glasses, joined by a retired police officer. They told Bannister they had aerial shots taken by NASA that showed a quarter of a million attendants for the first show. In reality it wasn't NASA, but one of Zeppelin's photographers who was put on a helicopter on August 4th, he took pictures and was told later to send the negatives with no further explanation. Bannister was never shown his photographs nor any data from NASA. Grant's people told him they were taking over Networth including the box office. Bannister's concert promotion company was forced into liquidation, it would be his last Networth festival. Second show. August 11th. Opening acts included the new Barbarians, featuring the Stones Keith Richards and Ronnie Wood, which didn't help in attendance numbers, with many reporting as low as 50,000 fans in attendance. Richards refused to go on stage that afternoon, Peter Grant forced him by shaking his trailer screaming yes you fucking are. Grant's security entourage got all the festival's money they could that day, with bags of cash everywhere being moved between trailers and limousines. Bands fees, merchandising money, car park tickets, the goal was to collect a million pounds, Grant got it all. Fearing for his family, Freddie Bannister signed a statement absolving the band of any wrongdoings.